Good morning. Our Advent journey continues. It's hard to believe we're already gathering for the third Sunday of Advent. As we gather together, let us awaken more fully to the presence and work of God's Holy Spirit in us and through us and around us. As we gather, may we truly celebrate God's astounding gift of salvation. For those who may not know, my name is Tom Abbott. I'm blessed to be one of the pastors here at First Presbyterian Church in Salida, Colorado. I have the great gift of sharing that pastoral role with Hillary Downs, and together with our gifted musicians, we'll be leading this time of worship. Great stuff is going on this week. There's three youth groups that are meeting, one men's breakfast, three Bible studies, and a prayer group. If any of that sparks your interest, we would love to help you get connected, so just ask us. There are also a host of volunteer opportunities, so if you have some time and you want to get involved, please connect with us, and we can find a great spot where you can use your gifts in a way that will bless you and the congregation and the community. If you'd like to make a financial donation to the church's mission and ministry, you can drop your gift in the basket in the back, or you can give online, or you can always send your donations to the church and every gift is truly a blessing to our life together. So Liz has an announcement she wants to share with us this morning. I made it worse. Oh. <laughs> I just wanted to let you all know that I am putting on a concert on December 20th here. It's at 6.30, all of you are invited. It is a concert slash party, so your admission ticket is to bring an hors d'oeuvre. Um, if your name is A through L, it should be something sweet. If it's M through Z, something savory, because we'll have plenty of time to eat and have some drink, some hot cider or whatever. Um, I have a small women's ensemble who will be singing, and I also have a woodwind trio, and uh, two flutes are gonna play, and a string quartet, and it should be fun. It is Ye old Christy Moose. I just made that word up, but it, sound, it sounds kind of like Old English. It's, it's old Christmas carols, but you'll recognize most of them, and there'll be some audience participation too. So 6.30 on the 20th, that's a Monday night before Christmas, Please come and feel free to bring a friend. If you think you will come, if you would just let me know, um, it just helps us with setup, how many you might bring. Uh, also, in the Thursday email blast, there's a blurb on it, and my phone number's in there. You can call and leave a message or call and talk to me and tell me if you can come, how many people would be. That would be helpful. But if you forget to do that, still come. All right, thank you. You're welcome. And if you forget what kind of food you're supposed to bring, just bring dark chocolate. It always works. Yeah. Today, immediately following our time of worship, we're having a congregational meeting. So if you're able to stay for that meeting, just stay put. We're going to start the meeting as quickly as we can after our service ends. If you need to head out, that's fine. Um, don't worry about that at all. But if you're able to stay for the meeting, that would be a great gift um, to our life together. There's Advent devotions in the hallway. It's not too late to enjoy them, so please take one home with you. You got an insert about poinsettias. If you'd like to order a poinsettia in honor or memory of someone, um, please just turn those into the church office with your uh, financial gift for that, and we'll have those poinsettias in the sanctuary for Christmas Eve. Next Sunday, we return to our two worship service schedules, so there'll be a, a worship service at 9 and a worship service at 11, and then we're into Christmas week. So Christmas Eve is Friday night. There's worship at 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve, and then on Christmas Day, there's a worship service at 11.30 a.m. with a dinner to follow. And if you want to sign up for that dinner, there's a sign-up sheet out on the table in the hallway. Um, that would be really helpful for us to know how many people are coming to that meal 
on Christmas Day. And then the next day after Christmas is Sunday, and we're going to again have one service at 10. So um, if you can keep track of that, I know it'll be a miracle, but um, <laughs> we, we hope that you will uh, be able to participate in as much of our worship time together on Christmas weekend as you're able to. Well now, let us begin our time of worship as we awaken more fully to the truth that we are in God's presence. God is with us, Emmanuel. So let us join our hearts in song as we begin this time of worship, and you can stay seated for this first chorus that we begin with. Let's begin our time of worship. I'm reading from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 through 20. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home. At that time, I will gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. We light the candle of our journey. We light the candle of prophets. Prepare the way, prepare the heart and mind. Let everybody stand silent. Let the stars and moon cease to move. Let the leaves of the trees and the tall grass cease to rustle in the wind with expectant hush. 
the long awaiting yearning. We wait for the coming of the light of Christ to the world. Today we light the candle of joy. We light the third candle of Advent in a circle of God's eternity where Jesus came to live with us, filling our hearts and lives with joy. We wait with impatience. We rush around preparing for the festives, not leaving space to prepare our hearts. God, help us wait in faith. We wait in excitement. We, we, are, we are ready to celebrate. We know the story with humbleness and simplicity in wonder. God, help us nurture our joy. We hear of John the Baptist being a messenger, preparing the way for change, signs pointing to a new age to come. God, we continue to wait for your promise of wholeness in the coming of Jesus, your beloved. Let us pray. We travel through Advent as forgiven people, lifting our faces towards the light. Let us walk together in hope, faith, and trust. Amen. you would please stand while we sing our next song. Voice they cry, 
continue to enter into worship, let us pray. God, you are the God of grace, the God of peace. You are the God of power and might. You are the God who creates and who provides. To you, O Lord, we lift our hearts, and to you, O Lord, we offer our thanks and our praise. We thank you, Lord, for knowing every bit of every minute of our lives. In you and with you, we are never alone and always loved. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful season of Advent where we are so reminded that you have walked this road just as we have. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of community that you created us to be together, and we thank you for this gathering of your people that encourages us and strengthens us in our relationship with you. God, we also bring to you the things that we need to let go of this week. The mistakes that we have made, the moments that we are not proud of. God, forgive us, we pray for the times that we have said hurtful things that lacked compassion. Forgive us, we pray, for the times that we have sought our own well-being in ways that have turned aside others. Forgive us, we pray, for the moments when we chose to turn away from the needs of those who are hurting in this world because it just didn't suit our mood. We thank you, Lord, for your grace and for your compassion with us. We thank you that you forgive us, that you wash us clean, and that you send us out into a new day. And as we seek you today in this time of worship, Lord, we pray that we would find you, that we would discover new things, and that we would be drawn ever more into knowing you. Amen. Well, our scripture reading comes today from Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. So let's listen to and for God's word as we find it there. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away and you comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the nations. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And if there are any kids here, I know there are kids here, who want to come down and have a seat with me on the steps for our children's time, come on down. Hi, Corbin. Let's see. I'll sit. Oops, I have this. Hi, Emerson. Hey, guys. 
Hi, hi. Are you going to have a seat, Emerson? Yeah? Next to Corbin? That's a good spot. Um, so we are talking a little bit about today about trust. Um, so how do you know what's in this bag? You can't see through the bag. How would you know what was in it? You'd have to look, maybe. Yeah? Um, so if I said that there's a candy cane in this bag, would you trust me? No. Um, why not? Because you never saw what's in the bag. Okay, that's good. Um, I've never given you a candy cane before, I don't think, so why would there be a candy cane in here? Or I've had a candy cane. You've had a candy cane, yeah. What if I said, okay, there's not just one candy cane in here, there's a whole bunch of candy canes in here. You don't think a whole bunch of candy canes would fit in this bag? That's that's fair. Maybe if they're mini. Maybe it's a present. Maybe it's a present. Um, what if I say there's a whole bunch of candy canes in here, and I'm going to give one to each one of you? Would you trust me? Yes. 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 No. Maybe. Yes. Maybe. I know. How do you decide how when to trust somebody? You guys, you guys trust your moms and dads, right? Because they've shown themselves to be trustworthy, and you trust people that your parents have told you to trust, like teachers and police officers and firefighters and maybe even pastors. Only if it's a present. What? Only if it's a present. Only if it's a present, you trust them? No, I said not trust them. Oh, you wouldn't trust them because you don't know what's inside. But we trust people, right, because they've shown us in the past that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. Like your parents, they're going to take care of you. And they might not always do what you want them to do. There might be nothing in that bag. There might be nothing in this bag. That's true. <laughs> so, um, well, I was thinking about, what's that? Can we open it? In a minute, we can open it. Um, the Bible teaches us that we can trust God because God always does what he says he's going to do. And here at Christmas time, in Advent, we are remembering that God made a promise to his people that he was going to um, send a Messiah, a Savior. And we celebrate at Christmas that God kept his promise because that's what God does. He keeps his promises and we can trust him always. They had to wait a long time. Sometimes we have to wait a long time when somebody promises us something. But God always comes through and keeps his promise. Um, so that's what we celebrate. And um, tell me what's in here, Elena. Candy canes. <gasps> There's some candy canes in there. Yes. All right. Okay, we are going to pray, and then I will give you a candy cane, and you guys can go off to Sunday school. Okay. Sorry, Justin. Um, God, thanks so much that you love us. Thanks, God, that we can trust you always with everything and that you always keep your promises. Amen. All right. Uh huh. Good to have your mama help you. Oh, you saw. Yes, that is a good movie. He loves candy canes and Elf. Okay. It's for your dad, right? Better be for. I'll trust you, Elena, that that's for your dad. How's that? Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, believe it or not, we made it another year. And we're going <laughs> to... And we're going to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior. 
And of course, I'm going to play Holy Night. Thanks, Mike. Stories shape us. If we allow ourselves to enter the biblical story, it will shape us. Of course, other stories shape us as well. When you think about the books that you have read, the movies that you've watched, the TV shows that have captured you, what was it about that story that grabbed your attention. One of the stories that has shaped me is Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. 
Two of the main characters are two small hobbits, Frodo and Sam. Frodo and Sam began a great quest as a part of a group of nine, but after a while, Frodo and Sam traveled alone, carrying a great burden. The burden was a ring, the ring of power, a ring with the power to coalesce evil. Frodo carried the ring, but together, Frodo and Sam overcame all of the challenges of their journey, hoping to reach the spot where the ring could be destroyed. As Frodo and Sam traveled, the power of the ring eroded Frodo's ability to trust Sam. Even though Frodo and Sam had been best friends their entire lives, and even though they had rescued each other time after time on this journey, Frodo eventually reached a moment where he had lost all trust in Sam, and he sent him away. Immediately, without Sam, Frodo's situation became dire. If you haven't read the story or seen the movie, Sam decided that even though Frodo had lost trust in him, he was going to go back. He was going to return and he was going to continue to travel with Frodo. And as soon as Sam returned, he was able to save Frodo from the mess that he was in. They reconciled their relationship and then continued their critical, important, life-saving journey. It's enlightening to read or watch how different dynamics worked together to erode Frodo's trust in Sam. Trust in relationships can be difficult, can it? It can be a roller coaster. As you consider your closest relationships, how has trust worked in those relationships? How has trust been built? How has trust waned? Today we want to consider how trust works in our God relationship. We've talked about how humility puts us in a posture or a frame of mind to receive God's gift of salvation. And then last week we talked about how dreaming Dreaming about the gift of salvation puts us in a healthier position to receive God's gift. Because when we're dreaming about something, we're yearning for it. Today, we reflect on the need to trust in God in order to put ourselves in a place to receive God's gift of salvation. If we don't trust in God, then it becomes more difficult to open ourselves to that astounding gift of salvation. So how would you describe your trust in God? Your trust in God's gift of salvation. Today we read two passages from the prophets. Both passages have been historically connected to this season of Advent. Both Isaiah and Zephaniah were prophets in the southern kingdom of Judah, but they were prophets about a hundred years apart from each other. Isaiah was a prophet during a time of great regional and national upheaval. The Syrian army made military campaigns throughout the region, toppling local government after local government. The southern kingdom watched as their sisters and brothers to the north were conquered by the Assyrians, removed from their land and dispersed. During that time, the king of Judah, his name was Jotham, He had sold his soul to Egypt, gaining them protection from the Assyrians, but at a high price. Judah became a vassal of Egypt and its very different religious practices. Isaiah wrote his prophetic message to the people of Judah during that time. Zephaniah was a prophet during a very different time. At the time of Zephaniah, the Assyrian Empire was on the decline, while the Babylonian Empire was on the rise. 
And so neither of those superpowers of the day were paying any attention to little Judah. And Egypt, too, had lost interest in Judah. So Zephaniah lived in a period of political respite where all of the local superpowers left the little country of Judah alone to govern itself. The king of Judah at the time was named Josiah. Josiah became king as a child. As he moved into adulthood, he directed a great renovation of the temple in Jerusalem. During that renovation, a long-lost copy of the scriptures was found. Josiah, the king, read those scriptures for the first time. He wept as he realized how distant the people of Judah had become to Yahweh and the ways of Yahweh. Josiah then led Judah in a time of great religious reform. Zephaniah wrote his prophecy shortly before this revival when politically Judah was celebrating its freedom from the superpowers of the day, but in terms of their God relationship, the people were still lost. They were still very distant. Both the Isaiah and the Zephaniah passages, if you notice, they were, they were quite celebratory in nature. So considering their rather dire historical context, why and what are the two prophets celebrating? It seems to me that clearly the prophets were celebrating the nature and the trustworthiness of God. So even though the choices of the Jewish people had led to all of these political disasters along the way and incredible spiritual unhealth, each prophet trusted and they sought to assure the people of God's faithfulness, God's trustworthiness. Through your lifetime, how have you been assured of God's trustworthiness? What has eroded your trust in God. As I meditated on these two passages, I was particularly struck by one of the verses in Isaiah. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. God has become my salvation. It's a powerful verse. I would say that for most of my life, I have been a reluctant leader. <laughs> one of my, when one of my life mentors encouraged me to pursue pastoral ministry, I don't think it really dawned on me that being a pastor would place me in a role of leadership for the rest of my life. Of course, it didn't take me long to figure out what a pickle I had just put myself in. I quickly began to resonate with Moses at the burning bush where he negotiated with God, remember? telling God that he didn't have the gifts for this job, that he wasn't a good speaker, that no one would find him credible. As you know, God tried God's best to reassure Moses that God would provide what Moses needed and God would provide other people to partner with him in that leadership. Not surprisingly, at least from my perspective, as we progress in the story of Moses, Moses continued to doubt and continued to struggle with trust, even though God was true to God's word and provided everything Moses needed for his role of leadership. One of the challenges I have found living in leadership roles is that it becomes easy to think that you need to be in control. Or at least you need to come across to the people you're leading that you have some kind of control. (laughs) 
then as that facade progresses, it becomes still easier to think that, for instance, you can actually save the Israelites from the Pharaoh or save the church from the cultural forces of decline. It's easy to think that you can get everyone to agree on the route to take through the wilderness or to agree about the time worship should be or the kind of music that should be played or how the offering should be taken or what color the carpet should be or whether the mask should be worn or really most importantly, how in the world do we engage in working against the injustice? that's always prevalent in the world. Of course, as Moses discovered, getting a group of people to agree on the route through the wilderness, it never really happened. (laughs) Just as it's hard to get people in the church to agree about much of anything, in our lives, it is in moments like Moses experienced and like all of us experience as we try to provide leadership in different areas of life that the words of Isaiah become a great gift to us. Surely, God is my salvation. I will trust. And I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my might. God has become my salvation. Hmm. There's this tipping point in most of our lives between wanting to simply live responsibly and thinking we need to be in control. It's a rather fine line isn't it? Like people throughout human history, it's a great gift to hear these words. Surely God is my salvation. God is my strength and might. Because the fact is, we simply aren't in control. Even in positions of leadership, we are not in control. God is in control. God is our strength and might. The question for me and the question I would imagine for all of us is whether we can trust that God is our salvation and God is our strength and might as we travel this path of life. How often do we, like Frodo, tell God, take a hike, I got this. For most of us, trusting God day after day with all of the different challenges and experiences that we encounter through our lives, it isn't easy. Isaiah points out that a primary reason we struggle to trust is because of fear. Fear erodes trust. Fear blockades trust. If we're fearful of another human being, there is no way we're going to trust that person, are we? The same is true of our God relationship. If we're afraid of God, we're going to have a hard time trusting our Creator. Throughout Scripture, there's this really strange paradox. In so many places, we read the phrase, fear the Lord. And in so many other places, we read the phrase, Like in our Isaiah passage, do not be afraid. I would encourage all of us that when we come across the phrase fear of the Lord, we change the word fear to awe. Scripture calls us to be in awe of God, not in fear of God, especially as we think of fear in our culture. Fear, as we think of fear, fear that stifles us, fear that inhibits us to act, to love, to trust, that kind of fear truly does damage to us, damages our ability to trust in the saving work of God. If I'm honest, I have many fears that regularly weasel their way into my life, especially fears around leading And I'm guessing I'm not the only one. Fear truly paralyzes us from trusting that God's salvation is real, which prevents us from knowing the freedom God hopes for us 
in this life. Advent is a season for us to awaken to all of the different ways that fear slides and works its way into our lives. Advent is an opportunity for us to pray for God to remove the fear that hinders us from trusting that God's gift of salvation is real and it's for us. Friends, we fear. It's natural. It's a part of our journey But we don't need to fear because God is our might and our strength. God's might and strength are poured into us to support us through each day. The more we awaken to how our trust in God works and how it's impacted particularly by fear, the more we will be able to live resting in the gift of God's salvation. As we continue moving toward Christmas morning, let us grow in our trust of God's astounding, amazing gift of salvation. Amen. Let's continue to think about how we live in trust of God as the musicians come and lead us in song. I'd like to invite you to stand and uh, sing with us as we continue our worship this morning.
a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. No longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. Sing that one more time. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child. Please join your hearts with mine and let us pray. God, a lot of things in this world and in our lives, they are up and down and hard to follow. We don't always know who to trust. But we come here today to this place knowing, Lord, that we can trust you. Beyond what our eyes can see, we can trust you. So God, we bring to you everything that is on our hearts today. God, our hearts break alongside those of Kentucky and Illinois and so many other states in the Midwest that experience the tornadoes of this weekend. God, the devastation is astounding to see. So we ask and we trust, Lord, that you are with those people young and old and everywhere in between. Some who have lost everything, some who are doing everything they can to help their neighbors. God, we pray for your comfort for the families of those who died in the storm. We pray for the rescuers and the searchers that you would guide them and give them wisdom. We pray for the right kind of aid to be available for all who need it. God, we pray for the congregation and the pastor of the First Presbyterian Church of Maysville, Kentucky, whose building was completely destroyed. And we give you thanks, Lord, that whether buildings stand or fall, that you are still God, you are still mighty, you are still present and trustworthy in all things. God, we hear of tensions between nations. We hear of nations at war with other nations or within themselves. And we pray, Lord, that you would bring peace. And though at times it feels impossible, we know that all things are possible with you. We pray, Lord God, in this holiday season for all who are not feeling so Christmassy right now, we pray that you would surround them with your love. Be with those, Lord, who grieve right now, who have lost a loved one and who are facing a first or a second or however many it is, Christmases, that has been without them. We pray, Lord, for those who are struggling with illness right now. We pray for Nancy's grandson. We continue to pray for Cheryl's brother and for Marceline's daughter-in-law. We thank you, Lord, for doctors and for nurses and medical professionals of all kinds who so compassionately care for us when our bodies don't seem to do what they're supposed to do. We pray, Lord, for teachers as they enter this last week of school before the holiday break. May they find joy in the midst of all the excitement and the distraction of the kids. God, we pray for parents who are also trying to keep it together in the midst of busy days. And we give you thanks, Lord, for breaks, for times to breathe in the midst of so many activities. And we thank you, Lord, for the snow this week 
And yes, we do pray for more. And we give you thanks most of all for your son, Jesus Christ, who came to be our Savior and our Redeemer. And you taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And I invite you to stand as we join together in our closing song. You have poured out grace You brought me out of darkness You have filled me with peace Giver of mercy oh my help in time of need Lord, I can't help but see Faithful you are Forever you will be Faithful you are And all your promises are yes and amen All your promises are yes and amen Beautiful Savior you have brought me near Pulled me from the ashes, you have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this to free. Lord, I can't help but see. Faithful you are. You will be faithful, you are. And all your promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. I will rest in your promises, my confidence. Is your faithfulness I will rest in your promises? My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest in your promises. My confidence is your faithfulness. I will rest. In your promises, my confidence is your faithfulness. Faithful you are, faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are, all your promises are yes. Promises are yes and amen. All your promises are yes and amen. If you're able to stay for the congregational meeting, please just stay put. As we go out back into the world today, let us be a people unafraid to trust in God's astounding gift of salvation and all that it means for our lives. To God be the glory, to the earth be peace, to Christians be courage, and to all people be hope. The peace of Christ be with you now and always. 
Blessings on your week and blessings on your Advent journey. Thanks for being here with us. Thank you.